42 and Psalm 43, and we're talking about the matter of dealing uh, with the discouragement. We talk about the causes of discouragement. And then we talk about the matter of uh, what do we do, how do we respond uh, to that, and so forth. And so uh, let's uh, look at these two chapters uh, out of our scriptures this evening. In verse 1 of chapter 42. As a heart painteth after the water brooks, so painteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say unto me, Where is thy God? When I remember the things, these things, I pour out my soul in me, for I had uh, to go on with the multitude, I went with them to the house of God, with a voice of joy and praise, and with a multitude that kept holy day. Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him, for the help of his countenance. O my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore I will remember thee from the land of Jordan, and of the Horamites, from the hill of Mazar. Deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water spouts. All thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. Yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and in the night his song shall be with me, and my prayer unto the God of my life. I will say unto God, my rock. I've got that underlined, God my rock. Why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As the sword in my bones, mine enemies reproach me while they say daily unto me, Where is thy God? Why art thou disquieted, or thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. Now chapter 43. Judge me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. O deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man. For thou art the God of my strength. Why dost thou cast me off? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? O send out thy light and thy truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me into thy holy hill and into thy tabernacles. Then will I go into the altar of God, unto God, my exceeding joy. Yea, upon the harp will I praise thee, O my God. Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. Let's pray now, and let's ask the Lord to speak to our heart as we look into his word this evening. Brother Powell, will you lead us in prayer, please, sir? Amen. I want you to look in verse 42 and notice the times God is used in verse 1, in verse 2, in verse 3, in verse 4, verse 5, uh, verse 6, and up in verse 8, and in verse 9, and then down in verse 10, and then in verse 11, and then you come to chapter 43, in verse 1, in verse 2, in verse 4, uh, several times, and then in verse 5, two times. And then David talks about himself. How many times does he refer to himself here? I shall, O oh my God. And you go through the whole chapter and the 43rd chapter, God and David. And you know what it really bears down to? You and God, me and God. I know that people come into play and I know circumstances come into play. Uh, Satan is a big player. Demonic forces is a big player. But when you take away, strip away all of it in this matter of suffering and the matter of discouragement and the matter of disappointment, we really need to get down to the fact that it's really just between God and me. God and you. After all, if I'm right with him, 
if I'm living for him, he will take care of me and he will protect me. I discovered this, and I, when I discovered this years ago, it really blessed my heart. And a preacher just made a statement in his pastor, in his preaching, and he said this, Obedience brings blessing. Obedience brings blessings. You know, so many Christians say, why? And David said that here, why? Over and over again, why? About ten times he says, why? 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 And of course he's having to take a hard look at himself and he needs to listen to God. And many, many times the things that are happening to us are happening to us because we're not obedient. We're not obedient. I said I was going to bring a series of messages on the church. Now, the church literally is scattered all over the world. There's churches, local churches in China, all over the world. Part of the church is already in heaven. And if the Lord tarries, part of the church hasn't even been born yet. And so, uh, you think about the local church. Many people don't really think about how important the local church is. And this new way of looking at worshiping is doing nothing but hurting the cause of Christ. Come as you are. Now, I'm not going to turn a man or a woman away because of the way they're dressed unless they're, so as they're modest. We, we would never do that here at this church. Never do that. But I don't know. I'm just the kind of a person that believes when you come into God's house, you should dress appropriately. And that's why I wear a suit. And I've had people tell me, why don't you just, just, just wear a, sh a shirt? I'll never do that. Never. I think when I stand behind the pulpit, I, I ought to look right, ought to look good. And that's me. And other preachers do differently than that, and, that, and that's, that's them. But Jesus died for the church, and he died for the local church. And what did he say to the local church? Occupy till I come, didn't he? He said, occupy till I come. And so when the church meets on Sunday... Sunday night, Wednesday night, whenever the church meets, I ought to be there. Unless I'm sick, unless I'm working, or you're on a vacation or something like that. We understand all of that. And the church is very, very important. But some people, they just have the idea that you can just leave it or take it or leave it. Well, then they wonder why they're not being blessed by God. Did you know he loved his church enough to die for it? So then we ought to love it enough to offend it. Now, I know I'm preaching to the choir here because you're the faithful crowd. You're here all the time. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, you're here. And you know what that does for a preacher? That just encourages a preacher. When he knows our folk that's going to be here. And so uh, he says here, God... And he talks about himself, and it gets down to the point that it's between God and me. The more I know him, the closer I get to him, the more I know of his word, I understand his ways. Now, the Bible says his ways are past finding out, obviously. The matter of God's sovereignty and man's responsibility, you and I will never fully, completely understand all of that even when we get to heaven, because some things God's not going to explain completely. And God is so far above us that he's out of our reach of ever understanding everything there is about him. But I want to know everything I can about him. I'll know his ways. I'll know what to expect, what not to expect. I'll know what he blesses, what he does not bless. And so here's David, and uh, he's uh, wondering about God. Uh, what's going on? Look in verse 3. My tears have been my meat day and night while they continually say unto me, Where is thy God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me. For I had gone with a multitude. I went with them to the house of God with a voice of joy and praise with a multitude that kept holy day. Why am I cast down? And he goes on, keep on saying, why am I cast down? Why am I cast down? We say that, don't we? Do you ever get discouraged? I do. 
I do. I get discouraged. We're human beings. We're going to get discouraged. And so he says, why? Why? He asks, so, and by the way, did you know it's not, not wrong to say that? It's not wrong to say that. Now, we don't want to question God in the sense that, that we think we know better than he. That's not what I'm saying. But we can say, Lord, why are you allowing this? Now, sometimes he'll show us, and sometimes he won't show us. Now, here is a man who's longing for God's presence. He's longing for God's presence. Verse 9 says, I will say unto God, my rock... Why hast thou forgotten me? Now, had God really forgotten them? No. But he felt like God had forgotten them, and we feel that way, and I feel that way. There are times that it seems like we're going through a desert. Doesn't that take place? We just feel like we're going through a desert. And I've been through that time, and I've looked up to the Lord and said, Lord, why is this happening? I don't understand this. I'm not getting any answers. I'm not seeing your blessings. I'm reading, and it seems like I'm getting nothing from Scripture. I'm not seeing anything happen. Why? Now, sometimes he's given me the answer, and I said, I see it. And sometimes he didn't give an answer, and then I came on through the thing, and... Bam, there's the blessings again, and there's the power of God again. And so we just have to wait on Him and trust Him. But all of the time, the key is, all of the time, looking for Him, desiring for Him, longing for Him, even when you feel abandoned by God. And David is feeling abandoned by God. In chapter 43, verse 2, he says, For thou art my God, or art thou the God of my strength. Why dost thou cast me off? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? And so he's longing for God, but he feels abandoned by God. Now watch this. He's hoping and praying that God will come to him again. Now, remember I said uh, last week, I guess it was, that we need to be very careful. Our emotions can play tricks on us. Satan is a master of getting into our emotions. Let me illustrate it. I was saved at the age of six age of six. Now, I have never doubted the fact that I was saved. I've never had to deal with that. I, I guess because I was so young and I just, I just got the thing settled and I thank God for that and I just knew that God would keep his promise. But as a pastor, I've dealt with people that doubted their salvation. And you know what some of them have told me? Here's what they've told me. Someone would come to our church a preacher or an evangelist or whatever and give a testimony. A drunk, drugs, women, everything, uh, involved in everything, evil, wicked lifestyle. I remember Bill Henderson coming with Lester Roloff to the chapel of Tennessee Temple. And Dr. Roloff was introduced by Dr. Robertson, and Lester Roloff walked to the platform, and he laid a great big knife about that long on, on the pulpit there at Highland Park. And he said, before I speak this morning, I want to introduce you to a young man. And there was a young black man by the name of Bill Henderson, big, tall, strong, powerful black man, standing beside him, a young man, just about 19, 20 years old. And Lester Roloff began to say, this is a leader of one of the largest gangs in Dallas. He was the leader of one of the largest gangs in Dallas. Murder, drugs, prostitute, and they were scared to death of him, even though he was a young man. And Roloff picked up that big knife and said, this is his weapon that he's used. But God saved him. And now he's been called to preach, and he's coming to Tennessee Temple to study for the ministry. And Bill was there the years that I was there. 
and then went into evangelism. And then Bill Anderson walked up there uh, and said this. He said, God miraculously changed me. And he went into what he was. And then he said, God changed me and gave me a, a new life. One of my friends that I had class with, uh, was, his last name was Beam. Frank Beam. I've tried to find him. I, I can't find him. And I was preaching a revival up at Pleasantdale, not at Pleasantdale Church, but in that area. And I didn't have a car, and Frank drove me up there every night. And you know what he said to me on Tuesday after that, that chapel service as we was going up there? He said, you know, I've had doubts about my salvation for a long time. And I said, well, Frank, why? And he said, well, like that man yesterday in chapel. He said, I've never had an experience like that. I've never had an experience like that. And you know what the devil is doing? The devil is using that man's experience to cause Frank to doubt his salvation. My salvation experience was totally different than Frank, or than Brother Henderson. See what I'm saying? The devil can use that. And the devil can use your mind and your thoughts and all of that to get you your mind off of the Lord. And I think with all of my heart as you read these two chapters that that's exactly what Satan is doing with this young man here. Uh, he's trying his best uh, to get him to doubt his walk with God. And when you doubt your walk with God, you open up an opportunity for Satan to come in and get even a more firm hold on your life. Be careful and don't give him an inch. Don't give the devil an inch because you give him an inch, he'll want more, he'll want more, and he will want more. Now look at verse 1 and verse 2. As the heart painteth after the water brook, so painteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God, when shall I come and appear before God? Here is his desire. He's thirsty for God. I love it when I'm thirsty for the Lord. I love it. I love it when I can't get enough of him. Now, I, do, I found out I can do some things to help me along the way. This morning, I uh, took Brother Jim's car up to him, and Sue was driving my car. And, of course, before we left, well, we read about the hurricane. And, uh, frankly, when I think we're not going to have church, well, I get mad. <laughs> I, I get mad. I, I don't want to miss church. I want to be here. I love being in church. And I love preaching. You know why? Because that's what I'm called to do. I love to do what I'm called to do. And so Sue could tell I was in one of my grouchy moods. And she just agged it on then. No, I'm just, I'm just joking. <laughs> I said, I'm just in a... Yeah. And so I went and took her back to uh, back home, and I came in, and I'm all I'm coming in and turning the coffee on. I'm grouchy and yeah, and I get in the study and I sit down. And I've got a routine that I do every morning when I come in. The first thing that I do is I've had a process of this for years and years. I'm all the time reading through the Bible. I read through the Old Testament. I read through the New Testament. I'm in Luke in the New Testament, and I'm still in Genesis in the Old Testament, reading a chapter a day, studying a chapter a day. And so I, I open my Bible back over to Genesis, and I'm still grouchy. And then I think for just a moment, I said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I know what I'm going to do. And so I went on my computer, and I turned on you know, old-fashioned radio, out in Texas and they play the greatest songs, the old songs, the great songs. And the song they were playing was this. I've got my feet on the rock and my heart in the book. And buddy, that just sparked it all. I mean, it just all went away. And they sang that song and I'm back. Now I'm reading in Genesis and now I'm reading in Revelation and uh, I know what to do when I get down. First of all, I want to hear some good music. If it's even in the background. 
I started to tell on Jim Brown, but I'm not going to tell on Jim. <laughs> uh, when I got in Jim's car, well, he had a CD, and it was of Elvis. Can you imagine Jim Brown listening to Elvis? <laughs> By the way, Sue loves Elvis, Jim, so you two, you two can get together on that. I don't know why I said it, Jim. I'm sorry. But music, it just lifts you up, doesn't it? It lifts you up. And then I got in the Bible, and you know where I was reading in Genesis about Joseph? That's where I was reading about Joseph. All is sold into slavery. His brothers wanted to kill him. Taken down into Egypt, bought by Potiphar. And then Potiphar makes him number one in his household. And then you know the story, and he's back in prison again. But even when he got into prison, the, the head of the prison said, look at this guy, and made him number one in the prison. God can bring us out, can he? He can bring us out. And David discovered that God could bring his out. And so here is, is his desire. He's thirsting after God. Now look at um, chapter 63, verse 1. Chapter 63, verse 1. O God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is is. I looked at that this morning and I thought, wow. Wow. I remember here one night uh, years ago, we had two twins that went to this church. Two boys, they were two twins. One of them never married, but the other married, married a young lady in our church. And um, she was here and he was up, up the country somewhere uh, on, on a lake in a lake house. And after the service, when I got the call, uh, well, actually, a policeman came and called me aside and told me that he had killed himself. So you know what I had to do? I had to take that young lady in the office and tell her. That's not easy. That's not easy. You know where she was? She was put immediately in a dry ground, a dry place, wasn't she? But God brought her through. And you know, getting through that, going to the funeral, preaching a funeral like that, how do you preach a funeral like that? My first funeral was a young man that died drunk. His mother told him, don't, don't drink, don't go out on Saturday night, and he did, and he got killed drinking. And the next young man was a 17-year-old young man. I told you about him, uh, that his girlfriend broke up with him. He pulled his car under her window, put a hose on the, uh, on the muffler, ran it around to the back seat, and let the gas fumes come in the car, left a note for her. And the next morning, his daddy called me early Sunday morning and said, Preacher, jury's dead. And I said, What? And he told me, and I had to pray. I think God allowed that to happen to me to prepare me for what was coming down the road. Did you know God can prepare you for what goes on down the road? It's tough telling somebody something like that and delivering that message. And so here you see his desire, but verse 3, verse 9, verse 10, you see his despair. And you've read that, so we'll not go back and read it, but his despair. He feels like a deer that's thirsting for God, or thirsting, but there's no water. Uh, sometimes we get like that too, don't we? In verse 4 through 8, verse 11, he remembers God, and he remembers God's goodness, and he talks about how good God is. That's where we need to go eventually is to go to the point, go to the place where God will defend him, will defend me, and will defend you. And when there's no light, remember that God is light. Amen? And that he'll be there for you. So, there are, there will be defeats, 
And out there somewhere in our future, there's some dry land. And we just need to get through it. Amen? Amen. I heard a man talking about his wife. He said, my wife is either just come through a nervous breakdown, is having a nervous breakdown, or is planning one real soon. Now, men do that too. So, I hope that's not the way you are. But whenever times are tough, let's remember what David said here, and let's remember how God brought him through out on the other side. I like verse 5 of chapter 43. Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. I guess I've got to tell you this, to just be honest, and I'll tell you what a great wife I've got. I'm watching the Tennessee football game the other night, and I'm so dadgum mad by the time halftime rolled around as I'm watching this junk play football like that. Boy, Mike and I take our football seriously. Right, Mike? That's right. So I went to bed. I just went, you know what she said to me before I went to bed? They'll pull it out. That's okay. They'll pull it out. They're going to do it. They're going to do it. Yeah, I'm going to bed. Three o'clock, I woke up, went to the bathroom, turned on the light, and there's a great big piece of paper. Tennessee wins, 42-41. Ha, ha. <laughs> oh, yeah, you women love that, don't you? Yeah, you, yeah, you love it. Uh... Reggie, we're talking about football. That, that's what I was getting at. Football, and my team was going to lose, but then they won. So just I want to explain. Bill, explain that to him after the service. Is okay? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Take, take him home. Take him home, Betty. Let's stand, please, and we'll be dismissed in prayer. Aren't you glad we can laugh even though there's a hurricane coming down on us? We can still laugh as believers. Amen. I thank God for it. All right. Uh, let's pray. Uh, Brother Bo, would you dismiss us? Thank you.